Welcome to our third Zoom Aspen Brain Institute expert speaker series. We're offering this free series, hoping the series will be the foundation of building a global online community focused on brain health. Our objective is not just simply to reach a lot of people, but to help a lot of people. We would first like to thank Lugano Diamonds for their generous support as our national underwriter. We thank Lugano Diamonds for choosing Aspen Brain Institute as a nonprofit worthy of their support and their values and for making our Zoom expert series free to the public and able to be viewed worldwide. We also thank Alpine Bank for their generous sponsorship over many years now. They are the best community bank in Aspen. And thanks to our friends at Brain Futures, which is translating science to advance human potential, and to our great friends at the American Federation for Research on Aging. Um, now, I wanna just take one minute to tell you uh, a little bit about Aspen Brain Institute and then quickly get to our exciting speaker, David Sinclair. At the Aspen Brain Institute, we're dedicating our lives and our work to making sure that this is the last generation of 60 to 95 year olds who are decimated by Alzheimer's and other dementias for which there are no cures. At the Aspen Brain Institute, we believe this is one of the greatest global challenges of our time. With that in mind, we've created a large aspirational goal. Our real mission and goal now is to create a brain healthy planet. So now in the time of COVID, we are producing this expert series of speakers. It's free to the invited public. Over 2,000 from all over the US and the globe have signed up for the series. The purpose of the series is to increase brain health literacy and to share access to the top minds and evidence-based research on brain health. Well, now I am pleased to introduce our expert speaker, David Sinclair. So David, yes. <laughs> David, uh, I'm just gonna do a real quickie intro because you're, well, you'll hear, we have some beautiful things to say about you, but David Sinclair is a professor in the Department of Genetics and co-director of the Paul Glenn Center for the Biology of Aging at Harvard Medical School. His recent book, Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To, was a New York Times bestseller, and David has started a conversation about what lies ahead for the future of the human species. He has been called the rock star of aging research and longevity, as well as Time Magazine has called him one of the great new thinkers uh, in, in, the, in the world. Uh, one of the most influential, one of the hundred most influential people in the world. So I think that's a lot of great accolades. And I think that after you hear David speak, you'll find out he's the real deal. So David, welcome to the expert series. We're anxious to hear what you have to say. Welcome, David. Thank you, Glenda. Uh, I appreciate that introduction. Uh, I hope I don't disappoint. And, and thank you to the Aspen Brain Institute for, for hosting this. It's a wonderful thing. Um, and also, I thank, thank you to everybody who's tuning in today. Uh, I'll try not to disappoint. Um, so, Glenda, should I start with my talk now, do you think? Please do. All right. Let me try to share my screen with all of you. <clears throat> uh, so this is uh, just the beginning slide. Okay. Now, it, we think we all know what aging is, but actually we don't. Uh, I've been studying aging 
for really most of my life since I was 24, I'm now 50 years old. And we still don't know what aging is, but I think that we finally have a grasp on what really is ticking within our body. Um, and it's revolutionary, this new concept, which I'll tell you about today. And along with this new view of what aging is, uh, we've got new ways of measuring it. And how do we do that? I'll tell you that as well. And now that we have a, at least I believe we have the first true handle on what's going wrong in the body in a, a re really scientific way, not just you know, we, we see things changing. Uh, the question is, can we slow it? And can we even reverse it? Um, and I think that we're on the verge of being able to not just answer these questions, but truly make a big difference uh, in human health. And so that's what I want to tell you about today. Um, so before I go on, I just want to tell you a little bit of history. I've only got, I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes, but no more. Um, so the aging field was once the backwater of biology. It was not considered the kind of thing that great scientists work on. Um, and if, fair enough, a lot of people have tried to work on aging going back probably the last 500,000 years, and we haven't made a lot of progress. But finally, over the last 20 years, and even more so in the last couple of years, um, I really believe, and, and many of my colleagues as well believe, that we've, we've got a handle on this thing, much the way that we finally had a grasp on what causes cancer in the 1960s and 70s when we discovered genes that control that process as well. And of course, there, there are drugs now that we can very precisely target tumors. And no one would dream of just saying about cancer, well, that's just life. That's the way things go. And the same 20, 30 years from now, we're going to say the same thing about aging, perhaps even sooner than that, that they'll look back at today and say, how did we possibly just accept that we get sicker as we get older and not even try to do something about the root cause of all of those problems? Because aging, uh, is, it's a fact that aging is the root cause of most suffering on the planet. Actually, by far, nothing else really matters. There are certain disease-specific processes, no question, that, and I'm the first to say we should put more, more money into those. But we're actually ignoring one of the main, the elephant in the room, actually, which is the aging process makes us susceptible to those processes that lead to disease. And if we stay young, or if we at least slow it down, uh, we should be resistant to those diseases and not just Alzheimer's. Imagine you have a, a, a pill that you take to keep your brain healthy, but as a side effect, you'll protect your heart, your kidneys, your, even your skin. Um, that's the future that I want to talk to you about today. All right, you're probably asking, David, why are you showing me spools of nylon thread? And you'd be right to ask me that. What this is, is a simplified version of how our DNA is packaged in the cell. Of course, DNA isn't just flailing around like a, a naked string. Uh, the cell has to package it very neatly. Uh, and it does so in a similar way to these spools. The DNA is wrapped around proteins tightly. And only when the gene needs to be read, it will open up a bit like the, the band on the right of this screen. And for the rest of the time, the DNA is bundled up tightly. We call this gene silencing. And this is really what plays the music of our lives. This is the piano and the pianist that tells a brain cell, a young brain cell to stay a brain cell, a functional brain cell for many decades. If we didn't have this packaging, cells would all be the same. And we wouldn't have the beautiful body that we, we have when we're young. And what I'm going to put forward today is the concept that the unraveling of this structure, the components in the cells that maintain cellular identity by bundling up the DNA and opening it up when it's needed, that becomes a problem as we get older. So of course it doesn't look like nylon, but it looks similar. This is more similar to what you could see if we zoomed in, we could dive through the outside of the cell, then right deep down into the nucleus, pierce the nucleus, and we find ourselves looking at 
part of one of our chromosomes. And what we would see is this DNA, which is shown here in blue. This is what represents or encodes all the information. These, most of this, uh, well, uh, some of it, not, not most of it, some of it is our genes that encode proteins and other things that help the cells survive and stay young. So how does the cell know which parts to bundle up and keep bundled up for decades and which ones to, to open up and maintain cellular identity? What the cell does is it puts chemicals onto the DNA and also onto these green spooling proteins we call histones. And in that way, the cell can control how the cell is turning genes on and off. This would be a gene that's on because it's not tightly bundled. But you can see on the far left, up the top, that there's, there's a bundle of these histones. And if you package that really tightly, that, that could be a gene that's switched off for many years. And if we didn't have this beautiful concerto, what would happen is our cells wouldn't have identity and neurons wouldn't function in fact, you might wake up and you find that your brain has turned into a kidney, for instance. So we definitely don't want that to happen. But what I'm proposing to you is that a breakdown in this information storage system in each of our cells may be an underlying cause of the aging process that leads to many of the other causes that we know of, such as mitochondrial dysfunction, the power packs of the cell breakdown, the loss of the telomeres, the ends of our chromosomes, the loss of, of uh, stem cells, senescent cells, which can accumulate even in the brain. These are zombie-like cells. I'm proposing uh, in my research, and I'm telling you about today some of the, the experiments we've done, that points to this system being core as to why we fundamentally don't stay young. We can actually measure these chemicals that get added to the DNA. They're called DNA methylations. And methylation is just a complex chemical term for one carbon with three hydrogens, like a, a cloverleaf chemical. And it gets stuck onto the DNA. And that tells us how to form a beautiful young baby. And that sets us up for life. But what my colleagues have discovered is that those chemical groups don't stay the same over time. Some get added on accidentally, some get taken off accidentally. And we can map these changes with a, a simple DNA sequencer, we, which you can have on, on any desk or any, any high school these days. And we can use that changing pattern to actually map how old someone is. But interestingly, not how old they are based on their birthday candles, but how old they are based on their biological age. And some people are younger and some people are actually older. And we find that people who don't look after themselves physically end up older and those that do all the right things that doctors tell us are healthy end up younger. Now, there's a concept that I think you'd like to hear about, which is called hormesis. And the, the, it's a simple word that means what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And what the problem has been with modern society is we've become, we've become very good at giving us comforts, uh, lots of food. Uh, we don't have to exercise. We even our uh, our luggage has wheels, and so our bodies are not put under any perceived threat. And without that, we don't get this hormesis effect. Our bodies get lazy and they don't protect themselves. And what we've discovered as a field is that there are a variety of these hormesis triggers, and I'm listing some of these. There's high intensity interval training. You'll recognize many of these as being what your doctors would recommend. This makes your body think it's being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. There's fasting, which makes your body think that it might run out of food. There's changes in temperature. There's low amounts of protein or low aminos. And there are even compounds that plants make when they get stressed that I believe, or at least I've proposed, uh, trigger the same defense responses. Basically, you want your body to be in a state of hyper alertness to be able to defend itself against a possible threat. Similar to if you made a prank call to the Pentagon and said, I see an army coming over the hill and the Pentagon mobilizes all of the, uh, the defenses, but there's not actually a threat. That's what we try to do with, with these effects. But the question is, why do they work? And so in the aging field, there's, there's hundreds of top labs now 
and thousands of papers in leading journals that have helped explain how exercise and diet and these other things actually work. It's a revelation. So there are many different genes uh, involved in this, but there are three families. They're called mTOR, which primarily sense the amount of, amount of protein you're eating, but other things. There's AMPK, which senses the amount of food and energy you have and exercise. And the genes that my lab have uh, worked on for the last oh, 20 or so years, these are called sirtuins. And there are seven of those uh, all the way from yeast to humans. And they're super protectors of the body. And there are ways to activate these to improve, we believe, the health, fitness, and longevity of our bodies. But imagine you're sick. Imagine you're, you're no longer able to do marathons or go hungry. Well, what we've been looking for in my lab, and there are many of other labs as well, there are ways that you can trigger these responses without actually having to do those things. So can you get the benefits without having to be hungry or exercise? And the answer is yes, based on animal studies. For instance, sirtuins need a molecule called NAD. Don't call it NAD, that's, that's not what it is, it's NAD. And it's a, small, it's a small molecule that we need for energy and chemical reactions, but we also have the sirtuins that sense how much NAD we have. And the problem we found is that as we get older, our bodies make less NAD and they chew it up as well. So an old person doesn't have these defenses as active as when we were young. There are plant molecules, both resveratrol and these MUFAs, which are monounsaturated fatty acids that you can get from your diet. Resveratrol comes from red wine in small amounts. Um, and oleic acid is the, uh, the fatty acid that comes primarily from avocados and olive oil and some other things. And what we've discovered is that these are enzymes that respond to these chemicals directly. They bind and stick to the protein and the enzymes take care of various uh, health responses, such as building new blood vessels, keeping nerves alive and active and giving us much more energy, among many other different things that we associate with longevity and health. And we know that, well, as much as we can know, uh, that in humans, these are protective pathways because there are humans that have variants of these genes. For instance, there's a gene called sirtuin 6, number 6 out of 7. And there is a variant of that gene that if you're lucky enough to be born with, you are relatively protective against heart disease and some other things that kill us. So we're on the verge, as you can see, of finally understanding how the body protects itself and to be able to make medicines that can give us much more health and longevity. Oh, I want to go back before I tell you about this. Sometimes people ask me, well, can you just take these things and you don't have to exercise or eat well? Absolutely not. What we found in my lab and others have found is that if you do these good things throughout your life, and you combine them with this, it looks like you get a double benefit. So it's no excuse to just sit on the couch and drink red wine. I'm not saying that at all. And besides, you'd have to drink about 200 glasses a day if you wanted the benefits, which is not gonna happen, uh, or at least you'd, you'd need a new liver. Uh, so NMN is a really interesting molecule. It stands for nicotinamide mononucleotide. And it's a precursor that our body uses to make NAD. And as I said, when we get older, our body has less of this NAD. So we found that by giving NMN to mice and to people, we've done now phase one clinical trials, it seems very safe and it's able to boost NAD levels in people by about twofold and bring those levels up to levels of when we were young. So I'm 50 now and if you were to take a sample of my skin, for example, it would ha have half the levels of NAD than it once was, once had. But the idea, as you now understand, is if we could boost those levels back up, maybe our body would fight aging and disease and even COVID-19 uh, a little better than it did without this NAD molecule. But I've only got about four minutes left, and I want to tell you something that I think is really quite revolutionary. That's even bigger than slowing down aging. It's called uh, epigenetic reprogramming. It's a long word, but really it, what it says is that we think 
that there's a backup copy of the information in the body that we can access and reset the youthfulness in the body. What I mean by that is we've been able to show in my lab and a couple of others around the world in the last few years that if you could just tweak the cells in the right way and even complex organs such as the eye, you can make the central nervous system behave like it was young again, not because it's acting young, but literally because it is young again. And we remember, we can measure the age of the body. So how does this work? Well, we, what we see is that when we're old, the DNA is all tangled and, and not well packaged. And somehow we're able to tap into this very ancient system that we first discovered in yeast to rebuild the youthful structures that tell a cell to be a nerve cell and not to start behave more, behaving more like a kidney or a skin cell. And when that happens, and we do this in a mouse, amazing things really happen. So one of the things we tried to do early on, and this paper, uh, I'm hopeful it will come out in the next few months um, in the journal Nature. Cross your fingers for, for us. Um, what we know is that very young nervous, uh, central nervous system uh, neurons, they grow very well in culture. And if you damage them, they can regrow. If I take an embryo, and I wouldn't do this, but if I did that, and I damage the spinal cord or the eye or the brain, it can heal. But in adults, that doesn't happen. We lose that ability. And the question is, can we reverse aging to the point where nerves can be like they're young again? And we chose the eye as the system because it's easy to manipulate. And what we decided to do was to tap into factors that control this system, the reset switch. Now, these, these genes, which are called short for O, S, K, and M, these were discovered first by Yamanaka, Shinya Yamanaka in Japan. And he won the Nobel Prize in 2012 for realizing, discovering that these four genes in combination, when you turn them on in an adult cell, they become embryonic again. And now you can make anything out of these so-called induced pluripotent stem cells. Of course, if we did that in our bodies, we'd be the world's biggest tumor. So that's not a path to health by any means. But what we've discovered recently, um, based in part on the work by the Belmonte lab as well, is that if you leave off this gene here, which is a cancer causing gene, and just use these three genes and turn those on in the adult, amazing things happen. So we chose the optic nerve, as I said, um, it's an easy way to access. You can uh, use gene therapy. What we use is a, a viral delivery system to deliver those three genes, OS and K, and turn them on after an injury to the, either to the eye um, or aging itself. And we asked, could we reverse the aging process such that the eye could rebuild itself? And what we do here is we crush the optic nerve with tweezers, as you can see there. And now all of these axons, hopefully you can see my cursor, they will die, okay? They, these were once beautiful, glowing, red glowing stained optic nerves. So the brain is back here on the left and the eye is on the right. And a lot of these nerves, even here uh, on the right of the crush have died off. This should be packed with nerves. And we know it's very difficult to rebuild the central nervous system, of course. But what we discovered is if we crush and then turn on our age reversal system, first of all, we can see that the nerves go back to being young. The genes that were once on when they were young come back on. So basically that concerto of youthfulness gets played again. And what we see is something beautiful. The longer we leave the mice, the longer these nerves grow back to the brain. In fact, we can actually see many nerves making it all the way back to the brain. Now that's crush, that's a very strong injury. And in fact, we think that injury is accelerating aging. But what about just aging itself? Um, in case I don't mention it, I wanna mention we also look at glaucoma and we have very positive benefits in glaucoma as well, restoring vision. So this is an old mouse that cannot see. And you know this because it's not tracking its head with these lines. Um, ignore the, the poop, it's just nervous, it's irrelevant. Uh, but if we turn on now this reprogramming system and re-establish re youth in the, the retina and the optic nerve, um, we actually get a mouse uh, that can see again.
Uh, I don't think I have a mouse for you that, that shows that, but um, I think you need to take, you'll need to take my word for it that this mouse uh, starts tracking uh, these lines again. So we were able to restore vision in these mice back to youthful levels. And then if we, because it's hard to measure a mouse's head movement. So what we do is we go in and we measure the electrical activity and we can see that the optic nerve is now working again like it was young. So this is the first example that I'm aware of, of reversing the age of the central nervous system and restoring vision. And now what we're working on is resetting the age of the brain. And it raises all sorts of questions that we can discuss about what would happen to a brain that suddenly became young again. Um, and so what I've told you is that there are genes that control how, how fast or slow we age, that we can read those changes in part by measuring those chemicals that accumulate. In fact, I could take anybody's blood today, well, in theory, and go back to the lab and tell you precisely how old you are and when you might die if you don't change your lifestyle. But also I've told you today that we have a breakthrough now that um, a few colleagues around the world and my lab have found a way seemingly to reset the age of complex organs and tissues such as the eye and others have looked at skin and kidney and it seems to work generally. And we're now looking of course at the brain and impact, in fact an entire mouse. Um, and I wanna just say that I'm very proud of the folks who've done this work. This is, these are the, work, the people that work with me. Um, the person who did most of the work that I showed you on reprogramming is Wan Cheng Lu. And he just became a doctor. He graduated during the lockdown um, and he's a, just a superstar, but they're all, I'm so blessed to work with yeah. such wonderful, ambitious and uh, hardworking, you know, and risk takers, you know, it's hard to work in my lab because every experiment has to be world changing if we can do it. Um, but they all have risen to the challenge. Uh, so I want to end there and thank you for listening. And I'm, I'm just so honored and, and, and pleased to be able to tell you about the work that we're doing and perhaps answer some questions and discuss what this holds for the future. Thanks. I think Glenda is Glenda speaking now. Yeah, Glenda's on mute. Glenda, I think you're on mute. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, David, did you hear my thanks? Was that muted? That was muted. David, I thank you so much for that exciting presentation. It's truly revolutionary. I hope all of our attendees understand this. And I think we'll all understand a little more when I introduce uh, Mark Hodosh, who is going to uh, either interview you or have several, have a just a general conversation about your revolutionary new science. Uh, and Mark, and you are old. Sorry, did, did she's still speaking? Glenda did cut out the last word. Glenda cut out. Mark is on the screen, yeah. but um, Mark uh, was previously uh, created and hosted the uh, acclaimed TED Med uh, program conference from 2009 to 2011. And he has a very exciting announcement uh, today because Sanjay Gupta are starting uh, a new uh, program, a conference called Life Itself. Then it's going to be very exciting. They'll uh, co-host leaders um, in, in the healthcare field and world leaders. So Mark, we're very anxious to hear more of that. Thank you. And, Thank you, Glenda. And again, since Mark and David are actually old friends or longtime friends, I should say, and they, I think what we'd like to do now is listen in on your conversation. So Mark and David, please go ahead. Thank you, Glenda. Thank you, David. And Glenda, you did cut out a bit there, so um, I no, appreciate well, your- Please fill uh, in for me. Oh, okay. Well, 
as you said, I'm excited that Sanjay Gupta uh, and CNN and I are, are launching a new health conference called Life Itself, but we'll have much more uh, announcements about that in the future. Today, I'm really excited to talk to David, who um, uh, we've known over the years because of a passion around uh, aging and really curing aging and uh, or looking at it a little bit differently. And today, David, I want to talk to you about three things, your latest research in the epigenetic reprogramming you just mentioned. Um, sort of about what you do, because that's always the question I suspect you get the most. What can I do? What do you do? You know, what should we be doing every day? And then I want to talk about the aging field overall, if we have time and open it up to a few questions at the end. So David, let's start with, um, you talked about these Yamanaka factors, these four genes that he won the Nobel Prize, and you've taken three of those genes and identified that these three can, in this case, repair a nerve, an optic nerve, which is fascinating to the idea that maybe we can help um, you know, people see again or use it for other nerve-related diseases. So my question is two things. One, why those three? How did you decide that the fourth one didn't make sense? And two, you said you're delivering these genes by a virus. Well, today we're all surrounded in this world where virus is bad, but you're using it for good. So can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I just want to give give thanks to you, Mark. You've been an, a wonderful old friend and anyone who knows Mark will know that he's, he's a force of nature who makes things happen. He connects people around the world and he's a great communicator. I'm excited about his new show. And I'm not just saying that, Mark, because you're a friend. Uh, I genuinely wanted to acknowledge you. Thank and you. Thank you for doing this with us. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the three, the four genes. Um, so the MIC, the M one at the end, uh, it's been known for 50 years to be a cancer-causing gene. So it didn't take a genius to leave it out. But the question was, would it still work? And would it be safe to put in three embryonic genes? And that, that's part of the revelation that we, we've come to, which is that it's, it, you don't need that MIC for it to work. In fact, it works better without it for age reversal. And I think that's in part because you don't want to push the system too far, right? You just want to push it back halfway. Go too far, it could be bad. And so without the MIC, it goes back to being young, but there's a barrier. It doesn't seem to go further unless you put MIC in. So we've lucked out there. So we left off MIC. Um, and then when we put it into mice, not just the eye, but the whole body we've now put in, um, this virus into, uh, we see for a year of turning these genes on, there's no downside. We see a trend towards even less cancer. And we're looking forward over the next five years or so to test uh, what these genes are capable of. Um, and the virus issue. Uh, so right now there are FDA approved viruses that are domesticated. The ones that are approved are called AAV, which means adeno associated viruses. And they're very safe for use in humans. They're not uh, dangerous. And you know they've had all the bad genes taken out of them but they do infect nerve cells and other cells in the body. And so for instance, a company called Spark Therapeutics, some people may have heard of Spark. They were the first to get an FDA approval to use AAV delivery of genes to restore vision in the optic nerve. And we're just riding on their coattails, standing on their shoulders, using those same technologies that are already FDA approved to deliver the genes. But ultimately, we don't wanna just have to use gene therapy my colleagues and I, including uh, the Belmonte lab that I mentioned at Salk Institute, we're rushing as fast as we can to find simpler ways to reprogram the body so that it could be a pill, could be a cream. We don't know, but we think that uh, the sky's the limit and it could become you know, just a, a simple pill that you take after 50 that keeps you younger for longer. So would that pill be like the proteins that the genes might normally be expressing or producing? Good question. So. The big question that I want to solve, um, or hopefully someone else can solve, but we, we need to figure this out for humanity is, how does the cell know what was 50 years ago in humans or in a mouse two years ago? There's a storage of information there that we don't fully understand. We call it the observer, which is an old fashioned term for a backup hard drive of the system. But it exists, we know how to tap, it in, tap into it, but we don't know where that is. Now we do know some of the clockwork. We do know that when these genes are switched on, these three genes, 
you need enzymes that remove those chemicals, the methyls, denomethylation. Because when we delete those uh, or knock them down in the eye, you don't restore vision. So we're starting to see how this thing works, but we have a lot more work to figure out the whole system. Right now, you know, it's more like magic. You throw them in and it works. But I think very soon in the future, I think a lot of people are going to try to figure this out. And when we get an idea of how it's possible that the cell knows that these 50,000 should be tweaked up and then these other thousand go down, don't touch these other ones. Once we understand that and who's involved, then we'll have a much easier time of making medicines that can do this um, instead of gene therapy. And the other thing I thought was really interesting is that you were using an antibiotic to activate the virus. Again, one of those things that people don't think go together. Antibiotics have nothing to do with viruses. They're about bacteria. How does it activate the virus? Yeah. Well, in biology these days, you can do anything, right? Uh, and you're only limited by your imagination. We, we do experiments in my lab that would have cost a billion dollars and a student can do it in a couple of days now for a hundred bucks. So as you know, Mark, and most people uh, who are paying attention to genetics, it's, it's, a, it's a golden era. And so what we've engineered for the first time is a highly regulatable system. So we can turn on these genes um, at will just by feeding the mouse or in the case of clinical trials in humans, we should be able to give an antibiotic. The antibiotic is doxycycline, which you can take for a whole variety of reasons. If you go to Africa and you don't want to catch uh, diseases, you can take that. So it's very safe, but we don't use it to kill off bacteria. It's designed to turn on these genes. And, we, and the good thing about it is the, the way we're planning, and I haven't told you this, but let me tell you, we're planning in less than two years to start the first clinical trial in glaucoma, which most people will know is pressure induced damage to the retina. Our plan is to deliver those genes to the eye, prescribe a course, three week course of antibiotics, which will turn on the genes. You hopefully will get your vision back. In the case of the mice, they get their vision back. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you stop taking the antibiotic and it should stay that way. You've reset the age of the cells. Now so you'll still age back again, but we don't know how many times you can reset. We've done it once. Yeah. Interesting if you can do it a hundred times. Why glaucoma? Obviously, you know, I'm fascinated by this particular research of yours because I don't think there's been a lot of people that have been able to regenerate a nerve, you know, quite this way. So could you see it used for paralysis and other nerve types of damage or, you know, other things in the brain or whatnot? Why did you choose this and how likely do you think it is to relate to other nerve issues? Oh, I'd, I'd be very surprised if it didn't work generally across the body and in, in human neurons generally. We've, we've tested it in human neurons. Um, it also prevents them from dying when damaged by a chemotherapeutic drug. Uh, we get the growth. I showed you those plates. I didn't have time, but we can get them to regrow as though they were young again. And those are human cells, right? Uh, this isn't mouse. So I think it's generalizable. I could be wrong, of course, but, but if I was to be a betting man, I would say it's a good chance that we will be able to reset uh, any aspect of the central nervous system or peripheral nervous system. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that we didn't choose the eye for any good reason other than it was a good model for the central nervous system. And others have done the kidney and the skin, which are very different systems. I think this is a very fundamental cause of aging that, as I mentioned, is found in things like baker's yeast all the way through to humans. And we're tapping into something that is old as life itself. I like that life itself. So, yeah. <laughs> so I have a, so, all right, so let's switch topics a little bit. David, if anybody hasn't read your book, highly recommend David's book called Lifespan, which will cover much more of this next little section of the questions I have that you get all the time, which is what do you recommend? And I know you don't like to recommend specifically uh, a prescription of sorts, but you do talk about what you do in your daily life to try to maximize your health. So, you take metformin, right? A drug that's by prescription only, typically for diabetics. NMN is something you're very positive about. Can you talk a little bit about things that you do daily? And then um, you know, uh, people are all gonna wanna know where can they get that kind of stuff? So maybe we'll get into that. Sure, well, it's tricky because I'm not an MD, I'm a PhD. Um, and a, some of what we're, I'm talking about hasn't been fully vetted in humans. So I, I want everyone to know that 
this is what I'm what I'm talking about is not you know standard medicine, of course. Um, you know that said, I'm my family and I were a bunch of scientists, and we wouldn't take undue risks. But there is a, a risk with every molecule that you put in your body. But these are natural molecules, with the exception of metformin, which is derived from the French lilac, so it's not too foreign. And we think that it's worth trying early, especially for my father, who's now 80. Um, he's got a lot more to lose if he, does, if he waits another 10 years, right? So he's taken upon himself to do something very similar to what I do. Um, if I, I mean, it's a long discussion about what I do, but I'll try to remember it. If I forget to something, page 304 of my book, I wrote it all down. Um, but if you read the book, please read the earlier chapters because it explains why they work and why everybody's different. And what works for me may be different for others, of course. Now, metformin, quickly, a uh, diabetes drug, but looks like in tens of thousands of people to protect against other diseases as well, including Alzheimer's disease. You will need to talk to your doctor um, um, and even convince them that this is the right thing to do. Typically, do doctors don't prescribe metformin unless you're already past the blood glucose levels. Um, so, but I, I, there are some doctors I know that are open to this, especially if they're ready to read the scientific literature, which is now pretty convincing. Uh, NMN, the NAD booster, uh, and then the re resveratrol is the red wine molecule that I sprinkle on my two spoons of yogurt in the morning. Um, I just wanna be clear, I don't endorse supplements. You'll, people use my name in my research all the time to sell things. I absolutely don't endorse anything. So please don't misunderstand me. And if you see a website with my face on it, please tell me, because I, I try to stop that stuff. Can you get NMN over the counter? Uh, you can, there are some people selling it as a supplement, but I, I haven't tested it, so I can't really and say why much. NMN over NR, another precursor, is it absorbed differently? Because I've heard different theories that yeah. it doesn't absorb if you do it orally or it does. What's the, your thought? Well, like most things, um, nobody's right and everybody's right. Uh, what I mean by that is no, nobody's tested these molecules side by side uh, in humans. So we don't, there's no way to know that NM, NR is different or better than NMN. Uh, you know, you, you'll find some people who say one is better than the other. Um, I certainly don't say that because we don't know. It needs to be tested head to head in humans. All I can say is I've been involved uh, in NMN human trials and I can vouch for that data. It's currently, NMN is heading into clinical trials for COVID-19 actually, because there's a fair amount of evidence from other labs that one of the things the virus does to elderly people's bodies is deplete, deplete NAD and that's part yeah. of its strategy. Um, what are your thoughts? Other things that I, do, I was gonna ask you, sorry, because I just read a study, I heard about a study yesterday where as we touched briefly on coronavirus, that yes, that a depletion of NAD may be detrimental to people who get COVID. And so boosting your NAD in some way through these precursors or, or taking NAD may be helpful. Do you have an opinion on that? Well, I think it's possible. You know, you, you can't just say a drug will work. We've seen how difficult drugs are to develop. Uh, but I think it's got a good, as good a chance as any drug that's being tested right now uh, there have been small case studies. There's one that was recently published uh, that, were, that looked very promising, but we need to do double blind placebo controls in you know, tens, if not hundreds of patients before we can have a better idea. I'm well aware of that. But I think it's a good chance because, um, and I'm, I'm just about to publish a, um, a review of this and other ways to potentially treat COVID by not attacking the virus, but by boosting the body's own health um, and, and uh, longevity genes. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's got a good chance of working. Otherwise I wouldn't be trying it. Uh, and, but a lot of doctors who've looked at the science have agreed with me. I mean, real doctors, MDs and said, yeah, of all the drugs that we're gonna test, this is one of the ones that we're gonna run in our hospitals. I like that you're acting as a guinea pig of sorts, but in a very safe way that you believe is safe. In fact, I think you've even put some of your uh, some of these uh, molecules uh, into your dad, uh, who's older and has helped him feel younger, very anecdotally, of course, but something that shows that you have a certain belief in the safety of them, but of course they need to be fully tested. For, for sure, uh, though I will correct you on one thing. I don't put anything into my dad. Uh, correct. My dad's a scientist. <laughs> he, he <does. laughs> 
Uh, but you know, you, you weigh up the risk reward and I think it's, for us, it's a pretty easy calculation. Um, there's never, it's nothing's risk-free, even, even a there... glass of water can kill you. So uh, I, but I, I try to lead a healthy life. Also, I'm not just sitting around. I've, right behind the, the video camera here, there's a gym. I work out four times a week as best I can. Uh, during COVID-19, the pandemic, pandemic, I've up my exercise. I do weightlifting. I do a lot of flexibility um, and uh, some aerobics. Mm -hmm. I do like to eat um, foods that are associated with longevity. The Blue Zones, for instance, um, the island of Okinawa, they eat. Uh, mostly vegetables. They are very active. They have uh, free fat, fatty acids that are good for us, fish oils, uh, tofu, but not huge amounts of meat. Um, and they're not sitting around watching movies. You can bet that they're in communities and active and supported. So I try to live a lifestyle based on those people because I think they're our best example of how to live a good life. But now we're learning also that if you live like that, your clock is actually going to run slower and age slower. Right. So all of these things from epidemiology to diet to molecular are all converging now on the aging field. So I'm gonna leave about five to 10 minutes for some audience questions, but a couple more on the last sort of section here. And that is sort of the aging, other ideas around aging research that you follow um, that we know about. And also on a greater picture, you know, the whole world is focused on coronavirus for good reason. It's a horrible disease and it's affecting everybody and it's contagious. But in perspective, um, and we should be doing that. But when that's over, you know, and, and prior to that pandemic, it's been hard to get the world focused on something like aging, which kills 100,000 people every single day. Why do you think it's so hard to show that to people? Do you think it's something the FDA needs to categorize as a disease? So we officially make a disease similar to what the WHO did in terms of categorizing it as a disease. And, uh, you know, and if we did do that, which direction do you think is most promising outside of your own research? Okay. Well, I, I definitely are a proponent that aging needs to be more of a focus of medical research and doctors. Um, and also the definition needs to change. Now it turns out that if you look up the difference between aging over here and uh, disease, the difference is, well, let's start with the similarity. The similarity is that they both cause bad things to happen over time that result in fragility and disability and death. We can agree on that, right? So why do we keep them separate? The reason is that a disease happens to min a minority of people and aging happens to most people, if not all. Um, and so if you live long enough, of course. And so we've kept them separate for historical reasons, but I would, I draw it more like this, that diseases are part of aging. They're a subset, and that aging itself is a medical condition that now we understand and can even treat. You might say, well, come on, aging is natural, whereas cancer isn't. Well, that's not true. All diseases are natural, but we've chosen to fight some, but not others, okay? And just because something's common doesn't mean that we should ignore it. In fact, it's the opposite, I believe. And we've done calculations, the field has done calculations that by addressing aging uh, earlier, it would be the biggest bang for the medical buck than tackling diseases that are already too late to try and reverse, we think. Um, put it another way, we, we, we focus on why we end up falling off the cliff without even asking the question, why do we get to that cliff in the first place? Now we have been working, and, and Mark, I've got to give you credit too, we've been working to see if the FDA would be amenable to recognizing aging as a disease, if not, you know, something more similar, maybe a medical condition. The good news is the World Health Organization has agreed that aging or old age is a medical condition. That's now in, in their manifesto. Um, the FDA in the US has agreed that they would, would consider it if we could show, say with metformin, that, that it does delay diseases of aging. And, and then that means- that, right? Yeah, yeah. So why is this important? It's not that I care about the definition. It's what would happen if we change the definition. Obesity used to not be a disease. When it was called a disease, now you could get medicines to be treated and doctors cared about it. The same thing would happen for aging. Right now, if you go to your doctor and you say, I need metformin for aging, they'd laugh at you because in their mind, aging isn't something they're supposed to deal with. That's just part of life. And we need to change that, especially now that we're learning that we may be able to in intervene as well early and maybe pre prevent a lot of the sickness that 
ends up costing us a lot of pain, suffering, and money. Yeah. So one of the questions from our audience, and then Glenda, if you have a couple, I think you do. Okay. Let's do it in a minute. But, but one of the questions from the audience was, are there any other organisms that have managed to sort of hack their system or that don't age or you know, stay young in some way? Can you elaborate on some of the things we've seen in that area? Yeah, that, there are. So we know it's not just to, to, to fight that argument that it's not natural or whatnot. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of, excuse me, a lot of species that are better than us at this. Uh, and they've managed to maintain this system. And we see that in bowhead whales and aspen trees that can live in that case for thousands of years, that these longevity genes that we have, but we don't keep on, unless, you know, even, even with exercise and diet, we can't keep them on forever. Uh, we've lost that ability, whereas these long-lived species we think are just lucky enough or at least have evolved to keep them on. Short-lived species, you know, take a, a large dog, for example, or your pet cat, they're unfortunate because their longevity systems are switched off even more than us. So it's very sad. But I think that we all have the capability. The same with this reset switch. There are species that... Um, can live forever. There are jellyfish that can respawn and become young again. And we know this is possible in mammals because we can clone mammals. In fact, there's no reason why we couldn't cl clone a human if it were ethical and allowed. What that means is the instructions to build a new organism are still in our bodies. We're just not turning it on when we're adults. So what I think is going on is that species like these bowhead whales and particularly the jellyfish and maybe salamanders that can grow new limbs and lizards that grow new tails. Or lobsters even. Yeah, lobsters, there's negligible senescence, we call it. They don't age. They keep these systems on. And now we're finally learning with modern technology how to turn these systems on like they do. Glenda, did you have a couple of questions for David? Yes, a couple, but uh, what you've discussed so far has been extremely interesting. I just had two maybe small questions. Um, David, I think you said in the book that uh, there are universal regulators of aging. Uh, in, uh, does every human have some of these aging regulators and do super agers have more of them? Oh, good questions. Uh, I should be jotting these down. Uh, tell me <laughs> if I forget to get to all of them. We, we have a recording. Great. Uh, so the simple answer is uh, we all have these genes. They're, they go all the way back to little worms and, and yeast cells. But we have different variations of them. And some people are very lucky. They have, there's one called FOXO3. And some people have variants of FOXO3, changes in the DNA code that protect them without having to exercise and diet. They're, luck, they're the lucky ones. And those people are the, the super agers. They can you know, smoke and, and are immune to it. Whereas most of us, we don't have that benefit. Uh, we can't say, oh, just because someone lived to 100, smoking mean, means we can all do that. We're not lucky genetically. Um, the good news, though, is that only about 20 to 30% of our longevity and health in old age is inherited. We know this from twins who live very different lives. Um, and twins can live very different lifespans by living differently. And so this is what epigenetic means. It means that your DNA is not necessarily your whole destiny. You can make the best of the genes that you've been given. Um, and that's part of the exciting thing is that aging is malleable and that it's not so much the genetic code that only determines your lifespan. It's how those genes are controlled, the so-called epigenome that can be reset now. Great. Super. Thank you. Um, and then this one is, I just have a little uh, confusion about a stressed body. You, you often say something like we should eat fruit and vegetables that are stressed. Mm -hmm. So I, what I'm kind of understanding is that a stressed body can stimulate the expression of longevity genes. But is there a difference between psychological stress and physical stress in accelerating the expression of longevity genes, if any of that made sense to you. It did, uh, and it's really important that we don't confuse the two. It's the same word, but it's not the same meaning. Psychological stress will not help you. Um, 
no. cortisol, for example, we're all experiencing that these days. That's not beneficial. But hormesis is a different form of biological stress, not psychological stress. We need to think of a different word, I think, so that we don't get them mixed up. Right. But yeah, you don't want psychological stress. Uh, that's not going to help us. Um, so, you know, along with good health and exercise, uh, meditation, relaxation is also extremely beneficial. Um, there's one thing, Glenda, I didn't mention that Mark was hinting at, which is uh, there are other known causes of aging. In fact, there are nine hallmarks of aging that my colleagues and I have come up with. And these are the roadmap to solving aging. Um, and I mentioned some of the mitochondria telomeres, senescent cells, stem cells. Now, they, these are very important, of course. And, and if we make a medicine that tackles each one of these, we can slow down aging and treat particular diseases. Uh, what I'm proposing, though, um, in this new idea, which I call the information theory of aging, is that if you boil all of that down and ask what causes all of those eight or nine things to happen, I think it's this loss of information that we can tap into and reset. And we know, well, we think we know this, because we, in mice, we can accelerate the age of a mouse. Uh, in part, one way is to create broken chromosomes and in the process of fixing those breaks, we get accelerated aging. And we do that in a mouse, those mouse, those mice uh, get old. They don't just look old and their organs don't just look old. They are literally old when we measure them. Um, and so we're now able, because we have, a, I think a handle on what's causing aging, we can drive it in the forward direction and now also in the reverse. Great, thank you. Uh, Mark, go ahead if you have some questions from the audience. I do, I have a question from Bianca. David, um, a lot of the research you've uh, worked on over the years and the molecules you've discovered ultimately relate to caloric restriction in a way. Um, and one of the things that's easy, relatively easy for people to do is fasting of sorts. And Bianca wants to know, how long do we need to fast to get anti-aging benefits? So you can you elaborate on that, maybe what you do in terms of intermittent fasting and versus longer fasting and how should people approach that? Yeah. Well, everybody's different and, and we literally don't know yet which is the optimum for humans, if there is one. There are very, uh, various um, modifications to this uh, intermittent fasting. Um, and I would suggest if you want to try it, and of course, we're not talking about malnutrition or starvation, of, of course, we just want to put the body in a state of want occasionally so that it gets a bit of a shock. So what I've found works for me is uh, my blood sugar levels go up in the morning naturally without eating. So I'm not hungry in the morning anyway. And if you're that type of person, I find it pretty easy to be drinking you know, tea or water uh, throughout the day, try to go through lunch um, if you can, or eat a small salad. And then I eat normally at dinner, not too much. And I try to be healthy, but but for me, that's called the 16-8 uh, diet, which is for 16 hours, my body is not full with food. And uh, after two weeks of doing that, uh, I'm not hungry. Um, in fact, I don't feel like eating. And if I do eat, I feel bloated. So if you're hungry during in intermittent fasting, I, I think you're doing it wrong. Uh, it, it shouldn't be that hard. Initially, it is because we have a lot of habits, of course. Now, I, I've never been able to do more extreme versions of that. Uh, I have a bit of a habit of eating when I'm stressed anyway. Um, but some people like to skip um, meals for a few days a week. And, and some people who are really good at this can go for a whole week every, say, three months. And There's a scientific study out there that Walter Longo did with Prolon, which I'm not sure people should do during the pandemic. But in general, I tried it. It makes the week-long fasting more manageable. Mm. Good point. There are fasting mimicking diets, and those can help. Uh, but what, what we think is going on is a few different things. One is uh, you'll turn on the body's ability to chew up old and damaged proteins, which normally just sit around if you don't activate it, because the body uses those old proteins to, to generate energy if you're not eating a lot of food. But also we know that NAD levels go up and these other longevity pathways that promote lifespan are activated uh, or heightened. Uh, and so you get all of these great benefits. Um, and it also saves money, by the way. So real quick, as I know we're out of time, I yes. want to ask one quick question. Do we have time for one more question, Glenda? Yes. 
A quick question uh, from Gazelle is asking, how does aging compare between women versus men? Does that help you in your research in some way? Because we do learn that women la you know, uh, live longer than men. So is that helpful to study in some respect? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I saw a question, is, are there side effects to metformin? Yes, there are. It's fairly safe. It's on the list of um, wor the world uh, essential medicines. But yeah, you, you, it's not risk-free. Talk to your doctor. It, it can have a bad reaction to some people. Um, so Mark, the, the question is about male and female. And we've discovered that when we look at longevity genes, some work better in males, some work better in female mice. Um, it's less clear about in humans, but we do think that women uh, have better longevity systems and it makes sense. They do live longer, uh, but not all the time. You know, you, women have faster aging brains than men, which is really, uh, you know, you wouldn't wish that on your enemy, but that's the fact. Um, and by studying, particularly um, in my lab, we study males and female mice and generally uh, some molecules that work in a males are not as effective in females. The ones that we're most excited by are the ones that of course work in all, se both sexes. I should say all sexes, I guess now. Um, but it, it's important that we understand that hormones are involved. We actually know that uh, estrogen and, and growth hormone are involved in aging um, in very different ways. And we don't fully understand male female differences and it's an important thing to figure out because it could help bring us all up to the same level and beyond that. David, thank you. I, I just want to say thank you for me. I know we talk often, but I always have more and more questions for you. So every time we, we talk, there's something new to learn. For anybody else who wants to dive deep into it, I definitely encourage you to pick up David's book called Lifespan. Um, you can read it a few times and keep learning more and more. So thanks, David. And I'm going to interrupt now and also thank David for the really marvelous presentation and terrific answers to the questions. And thank you to Mark Hodosh. Mark, I can tell you've done this many, many times. You're terrific. And thank you to the audience for the great questions and for getting educated and updated on the new science of aging. Uh, we have to thank our sponsors again, the Lugano Diamonds and Alpine Bank, and our friends at Brain Futures and American Federation for Research on Aging. Lastly, I want to remind everyone about the next session, which will feature Dr. Annie Fenn, who will be giving a cooking demonstration called Cooking in the Brain Health Kitchen, next Monday, June 1st at 4 p.m. Mountain Time. An ingredients list will be provided uh, when you register for this session at www.aspenbraininstitute.org. Ciao, everybody. Ciao.